The next speaker is Sophia Makarowicz, and she's going to talk about climate models. And I'll let her take it take it over. Sophia. Okay. Thank you. Can can everyone hear me and see me? Yeah, well, I can Good. see you and hear you. You're there. Okay. Great. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am a PhD candidate from the University of Michigan, working under Chris Polson. And today I'm going to be talking about ocean deoxygenation linked to abrupt global warming during the Earth's penultimate ice house. I'll be um, presenting some motivation and main results from a study led by Zhitao Chen that's currently in review and many others listed here. Um, Chris Bolson and I contributed the climate modeling work to this uh, study, and so I'll focus on that component, and then um, it also expand into some of my own work related to this study. Um, next. So ocean deoxygenation is the loss of dissolved oxygen in the ocean, and it has already started impacting marine ecosystems due to a combination of human activities, such as nutrient pollution and global warming. Ocean deoxygenation is expected to worsen in the future with continued warming because oxygen is less soluble in warmer water and warming typically increases upper ocean stratification, which inhibits the downward mixing of oxygen. This is a serious concern because the expansion of marine dead zones marked in these red circles um, uh, shrinks marine ecosystems and kills marine life. However, there's uncertainty remaining about the controlling processes of ocean deoxygenation and how these processes will change in the future. Um, next. So past ocean anoxic events or OAEs in the geologic record can be used to better understand the ocean's response to warming. Typically, intervals of widespread marine anoxia are associated with the warming of climate, rising sea levels, and even mass extinction events. This figure shows a series of ocean anoxic events over the past 500 million years, where local valleys in this dissolved oxygen time series coincide with local peaks in marine temperatures. This figure also highlights how most of the well-studied OAEs occurred under a background greenhouse climate state which means that these events witnessed much higher CO2 levels than the Cenozoic ice house climate we're, we're currently in. Um, next. That brings us to the Earth's penultimate ice house, as you all know, the late Paleozoic Ice Age, which coincided with CO2 levels that are more comparable to the Cenozoic glacial state, um, and also experienced some of the highest oxygen levels of the Phanerozoic. Next. So despite overall high levels of oxygen in the atmosphere and ocean, there's evidence for another OAE during a late Paleozoic ice age that could provide some insight into the global warming induced ocean deoxygenation compared to other greenhouse OAEs. Um, before getting into the evidence for this OAE, I'd like to give a brief overview of the world during this time interval. Um, next. So, uh, you all know, you've seen this you know, figure multiple times today, but the late Paleozoic Ice Age um, interval that we're interested in is the late Pennsylvanian. Um, and so this is when the supercontinent Pangaea was assembled. There were large multiple ice sheets uh, growing and melting across Southern Gondwana. And also the oceans looked very different during this time. There's the Panthalassic Ocean, which covered an entire hemisphere of the earth and then the much smaller Paleotethes Ocean um, that sits in between uh, Pangaea and the Caucasian Islands. Um, next. So now for the abrupt warming event during the late Pennsylvanian, which occurred over the Chasmovian Gazillion boundary, or KGB, about 304 million years ago, um, there was a global uh, warming event that is supported by several lines of evidence. This figure shows a paleosol and stomatal based atmospheric CO2 reconstruction that shows these uh, overall long term eccentricity paced glacial interglacial cycles that lead to a CO2 increase in excess of the typical interglacial range. So this suggests an additional carbon injection into the atmosphere uh, at the KGB. Next. 
This rise in CO2 coincides with negative isotopic excursions in carbon and oxygen at multiple different locations. Um, and that supports a sea surface temperature increase and a sea level rise. Um, there's also a global loss of benthic marine biodiversity. Next. So just coming back to this paleogeographic reconstruction of the late Pennsylvanian, uh, the pink star marks South China, which is the location of the two uh, records from open water carbonate slope successions that were analyzed for this work. Um, so the record sort of sits in between the Paleotethes and the Panthalassic Oceans. Uh, next. In these shallow open water records, I'm only showing you uh, data from one of these records today in the Napching sec section. Uh, my collaborators found a pre-boundary negative carbon isotope excursion, which has also been documented worldwide, but with relatively lower resolution in sampling density um, and age constraints uh, in most sections. So along with this negative excursion of carbon, there's a negative excursion in uranium. And if you're not familiar with uranium isotopes as a proxy for ocean deoxygenation, uranium isotope, isotopes are used to reconstruct redox conditions in the ocean. And so under low oxygen conditions, the dominant 238U isotope is removed from ambient seawater to anoxic sediments, leaving seawater enriched in 235U. So negative excursions of delta 238U coincide with periods of expanded marine anoxia. Uh, next, my collaborators, without getting into the, the details of all of the work that they've done, uh, one of the essential findings after using coupled carbon cycle modeling and U mass balance modeling, uh, which were used to constrain the extent of marine anoxia and carbon cycle perturbation, uh, it was found that the change in the uranium and carbon isotope ratios is explained by a 9,000 gigaton injection of carbon over 300,000 years and a 24% increase in the area of anoxic seafloor. Uh, also, the negative value of carbon injection released uh, is organic, but the source is still uncertain. Um, it could have been methane released from a large igneous province or melting permafrost. And so the, the part where my work comes in is the main question remaining um, and the main focus of this talk is how did this large increase in atmospheric CO2 lead to ocean deoxygenation over this boundary? So next. So to address this question and in general to provide physical mechanisms for environmental changes inferred in different geologic archives, I use earth system models. Um, and so many different versions of these models have been developed and refined by scientists across the world. But every Earth system model starts with mathematical equations of physical, chemical, and biological processes, as well as fluid dynamics that are able to represent the dominant large-scale processes of the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Next. These equations are then converted into computer code that can be solved over a global grid. Typically, this translates to about two to three million lines of code or 18,000 pages of printed text, depending on the configuration of the model you're using. Uh, next. Then this massive amount of code uh, has to be solved as a function of time using a supercomputer that's typically the size of a tennis court. Uh, next. And then finally, the fun part of this process is getting terabytes of data representing climate estimates like temperature, rainfall, wind patterns, sea ice formation, as Earth system models were originally designed to help us understand how the Earth system will respond to increasing levels of greenhouse gases in the future. Next. So the Earth system model that I used for this study is the Community Earth System Model version 1.2. And so in order to apply this earth system model to the late Pennsylvanian, I modify many different boundary conditions and parameters of the model, such as the paleogeography, as you all know, to the configuration of Pangaea. I also reduce the solar luminosity um, 
And so this configuration of the model is fully coupled, meaning that there is dynamic coupling between the atmosphere, land, sea ice, and ocean components, and therefore circulation is being represented in the atmosphere and ocean components as well. The ocean is about one degree resolution in by latitude and longitude. And here I'm going to show you results from two simulations called low CO2 and high CO2, which are intended to represent changes in the climate system due to CO2 induced warming over the Kazimovi and Gazellian boundary. Um, the low CO2 simulation has 280 ppm CO2. And as you can see in the top plot, it also has relatively expanded Gondwanan ice sheets shown in cross-hatched areas and relatively low sea level, while the high CO2 simulation has uh, double the amount of CO2 at 560 ppm, relatively reduced Gondwanan ice sheets, and then relatively higher sea level. So both of these simulations were run for 2,500 years to equilibrate uh, the deep ocean and we're going to look at climatologies from the last 100 years of each simulation. Um, next. So using these simulations, um, I want to try to propose a physical mechanism for ocean deoxygenation uh, over the KGB. Next. So before getting into those specific mechanisms of ocean deoxygenation, I want to provide a general overview of surface current systems in the low CO2 and high CO2 simulations. So just note that I'm going to always be showing results from the low CO2 case in the top panel and then uh, high CO2 results in the bottom panel. These particular plots are mean annual currents and temperature in the upper 100 meters of the ocean. So the first feature that I want to highlight is, of course, overall higher sea surface temperature values in the high CO2 case compared to the low CO2 case. And then in both uh, cases, there is a warm pool that the trade winds uh, push along the Panthalassic Ocean and build in the western Panthalassic Ocean up against, that, up against those islands. Um, and then as a result of that, there's also a robust upwelling system along the western uh, equatorial Pangaea. Uh, next. And in order to simplify these global streamlines, I've outlined the major oceanic gyres in each case. Overall, the simulations have the same general circulation patterns, but there, so there are subtropical gyres present in the Panthalassic and Paleotethys oceans. You can see those outlined in the red and yellow arrows. There's a southern, the southern gyre uh, present in the Paleotethys moves along the eastern coast of Gondwana with the direction of prevailing winds and forms another upwelling zone along the coast of Australia in both cases. And then in both cases, there's a subpolar gyre uh, in dark blue that forms in the southern uh, Panthalassic Ocean. Uh, and then the key difference that I want to highlight here in these surface currents between the two cases is that there is a differences in the direction of circulation over the North Pole or the Northern Polar Gyre. In the low CO2 case, the polar gyre is cyclonic, moving in the same direction uh, as the subpolar gyre in the dark blue. And then in the high CO2 case, the circulation over the North Pole is anticyclonic. Um, and so ultimately this is caused by differences in sea level pressure over the North Pole. Stronger cyclonic winds in the low CO2 case drive cyclonic circulation over the pole, whereas weaker winds in the high CO2 case allow for anti-cyclonic circulation. The difference in surface currents over the North Pole actually contributes to global scale differences in thermohaline circulation. And I'll elaborate on that in a, in a few more slides. Um, next. So now that we've gone over the basic gyre systems and changes in surface circulation, the first potential mechanism for ocean deoxygenation at the KGB is enhanced upper ocean stratification with warming. Uh, here I'm showing zonally averaged seawater density and temperature in the top 500 meters of the Panthalassic Ocean. So the blue contours are showing density. And then the red lines are showing you 10 degree 
uh, contours of uh, sea surface temperature. Um, and so uh, next, um, the so warming causes a combination of a strengthening of the surface halocline from increased precipitation over the ocean and a shallowing of the thermocline, which inhibits convection and ventilation of surface water masses. And so when I refer to ventilation, I mean the process by which well oxygenated surface water uh, masses in the mixed layer are injected into the ocean interior, providing oxygen to the lower levels of the ocean. Next. The second potential mechanism is a halting of deep water formation in the northern Panthalassic Ocean with warming. So this figure is showing you the climatological maximum mixed layer depth or the maximum mixed layer depth for each grid box over the entire year. So in the high latitudes, this always occurs in the cooler winter or spring months. Um, from this, we can see that there's deep convection occurring in the northern and southern Panthalassic Ocean in the low CO2 case, shown by those red regions, whereas in the high CO2 case, deep convection only occurs in the southern Panthalassic Ocean, shown in that another red region there. Next. This difference in deep water formation zones creates a reorganization of meridional overturning circulation. And so that is the zonally integrated component of surface and deep water currents in the Panthalassic Ocean. Um, next. So these arrows show basically the dominant uh, descending and ascending branches um, in the Panthalassic Ocean. So the descending branch in the southern Panthalassic Ocean of the high CO2 case forms one large overturning cell whereas there's another descending branch in the northern Panthalassic Ocean of the low CO2 case that forms another relatively weaker overturning cell there. This indicates that ventilation of deep water masses is occurring in both hemispheres of the low CO2 case and only in the southern hemisphere of the high CO2 case. Uh, next. So, so to demonstrate why this happens, these are polar plots of the northern hemisphere. So the North Pole is in the center of the plot. And the left shows sea surface temperatures and the, the right shows uh, sea ice fraction. So sea surface temperatures in the high CO2 case are too warm to form sea ice in the northern hemisphere, whereas sea surface temperatures in the low CO2 case allow for the formation of a large uh, sort of island of sea ice that reaches to about 60 degrees north. Um, next. So the seasonal brine rejection from the formation of this large amount of sea ice increases sea surface salinity and reduces buoyancy, allowing for deep convection in the northern Panthalassic Ocean. So in the other case, surface buoyancy remains too high uh, to initiate deep water formation. And in that high CO2 case, as I mentioned previously, there is anticyclonic circulation over the North Pole. So this circulation pattern also drives convergence of water, which further constrains that layer of freshwater to the North Pole. Uh, next. So one key caveat to these simulations is that they don't include active biogeochemistry. So dissolved oxygen in the ocean is not uh, directly simulated. Next. So the ideal age tracer in CESM is an indirect means to constrain ventilation in each simulation. The ideal age tracer tracks the time since a water mass has been in contact with the surface ocean in years. So young water masses are well ventilated or have seen the surface recently, whereas old water masses are poorly ventilated or they have not been in contact with the surface ocean recently. Um, next. So this, um, these two latitude by uh, depth plots show you ideal age in each simulation in the Panthalassic Ocean. And there are relatively young water masses at depth in the low CO2 case uh, in both hemispheres. So there's ventilation of those deep waters happening due to the formation of deep water there. Whereas in the high CO2 case, there's only young water masses in the southern hemisphere. So uh, Basically, there's a, a very old water mass that sits over that North Pole, and this makes sense because the stratification is too great there to form deep water, and so that deep water mass is not being ventilated. 
And so while we cannot directly quantify dissolved oxygen content in the ocean using these simulations, uh, previous climate modeling studies have shown that the ideal age tracer tracks with oxygen content in the deep ocean, meaning that it's likely because there are very old water masses in the high CO2 case that it's poorly ventilated in the deep ocean uh, compared to the low CO2 case. Uh, next. And with that, I'll just provide some conclusions and future directions. The uh, KGB warming event led to likely led to widespread marine anoxia and could provide unique insight for ocean deoxygenation in an ice house climate. Two plausible mechanisms for oxygen loss are increased upper ocean stratification and halted thermal halion circulation in the northern hemisphere. And then just for some future directions is we could run some simulations with active biogeochemistry to directly address uh, the dissolved oxygen content in the ocean. And next. And um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Sophia, for that talk. Um, we already have Eric Goldbranson has a question. Eric, can you turn on your mic and video, please? Uh, yes, great. That's a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question on whether or not in your model results, are you able to um, obtain like, like really short term, like decadal scale variation in climate phenomena, like such as like the extant, like annular mode in the Arctic? Does that kind of variability come through in your model results? Um, yes, I can look at those climate modes and try to uh, identify them. I've done a little bit of work in that. It's just that typically uh, the answer is yes, I can look at that sort of decadal uh, scale and find those climate modes. I just haven't really looked at it in terms of this study. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, did you say that this warming event involved 9,000 gigatons of carbon being injected into the atmosphere. Is that what you said? Yes, that is what uh, the results of this study that's in review uh, are, are arguing for. Where'd the carbon, where'd all that carbon come from? Yeah, the, so uh, in the, the manuscript, it's the source of the carbon is not certain. Uh, basically, they, they, they say it's organic in nature. It could have been um, melting permafrost, uh, basically the source of the carbon is, is uncertain. But that sort of level of, of carbon injection can account for the change in the carbon isotopes and also makes sense in terms of CO2 reconstruction. So, because I know normally, the, you know, you see that much carbon injected, you'd want volcanism to be the mm. place it comes from. But is there a, a plausible volcanic source at this time? I am not sure. I don't want to speak to that just because it's not my expertise. So I'll let others speak to that, but I'm, I'm what not about, sure. What about, what, what about Lynn Sorrigan? Uh, mm. what, what could you say about that? Or can you? Are you there? About, yes, I'm here. Mm -hmm. So what do we got? Uh, we got huge volcanic eruptions across the Casamovian gajelian boundary. Possible? Yes? Well, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, when I think about volcanic carbon driving relatively um, well warming like that. I think of things like um, like the Deccan traps or the or the Siberian traps or basically at um, large igneous provinces as opposed to um, single single eruptions but but slips, silicious large igneous provinces are maybe possible. Um, it's all about the time scale. However, I would think, Sophie, they should be able to, the reason they're saying organic carbon is because the isotopes, right? You, you can tell the difference between organic and volcanic by looking at the isotopes. So they must have seen the signal in the isotopic signature, right? Yes, yeah. But as, as far as distinguishing what the potential source could be, I don't think we're, they're there yet. Uh... Oh, so, because I thought you said they are saying it's organic carbon. Yes, they are saying it's organic. Okay, so it's yeah. not a volcanic source. Let's, uh, hey, Ron, um, Ron Martino wants to get in on the questioning. Ron, can you turn on your mic and video? Hi, Sophia. Um, 
one would expect with increasing ocean anoxia, uh, an increase in the amount of preservation of, of organic carbon in, in at least deeper marine and perhaps shallow marine strata. Is there any corroboration of this, uh, you know, in terms of the extent of so-called black shales that you're aware of? Um, I think that the I think that yes, they they cite that you know it's not my um, area, but in the manuscript that that's part of the support for expanded marine anoxia in those shallow deposits. Um, so yeah, and this would be at the uh, the boundary between the uh, Casamobian and the Gadelian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And Bill DeMichael has a question. Bill. Okay, I've almost forgot. I'm being buzzed here by the, the U.S. Naval Academy graduation is tomorrow, and the, the practice planes fly right over my house every year. So there are these aircraft flying at two times tree height over the house. Okay, if they <laughs> so, start dropping bombs, Bill, uh, yeah, let us may, know. <laughs> you may hear them. I, 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 I wondered, Sophia, what the – and you, you sort of alluded to this, but generally what um, – what was happening with terrestrial climate that uh, if, if you've pumped all this stuff into the atmosphere, um, gosh, I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, the, uh, because coals start to pick up again in the, in the Virgilian, um, in, at least in the Appalachians, you get the big Pittsburgh coal bed. And that may be just depositional environment or tectonics, but I just wonder what's happening with the with um, sort of rainfall across the tropics and all that at this time. That is, you mean as far as my simulations yeah. uh, would support? So yeah, that's sort of another aspect of my research that I didn't uh, present today. But um, so it, it's interesting when I have two simulations, could, because I know this is a question, right? Is how, how was the rainfall and overall hydroclimate in the tropics responding to changes in CO2 and sea level? And uh, in my simulations, one key component is that typically we're using these modern analog uh, plants, these modern plant functional types in the simulations. And so when I would use that type of vegetation cover overall in the tropics, when I increase CO2, I see increased rainfall over the ocean as well as in the tropics uh, as, a, as a general rule. But an interesting change um, that I've seen in those dynamics is when, you know, this other project I have going on of incorporating the paleo plant physiology into the earth system models is actually you see some regional differences that, that occur when you incorporate that uh, paleo plant physiology. And so I was looking at, you know, those regional differences and seeing that in particular in Western Pangaea, Typically, rainfall increases everywhere with increased CO2, but in Western and parts of Central Pangaea, you actually see enhanced drying um, with increase in, increases in CO2. So that was like a very uh, particular regional response that was going on there. Um, I hope that speaks to your question. Yeah, that's very interesting because the I think sometimes um, because of the, we get used to the, a certain coarseness in our resolution, that we tend to paint with these big broad brushes. And if we actually look at the vegetation on the ground, and I can't speak for the vertebrates, it would be interesting to know if they showed similar patterns. There's definitely uh, spatial variability. And, um, and so a model that was starting to pick up spatial variability would be very uh, significant. I'd like to see your data eventually. I'll be uh, publishing that hopefully soon. Well, you know, not super soon, but I'm working on that right now. Great, thanks. And, and why would that be? It's counterintuitive to me. Why would there be drying in Western Central Pangaea? What, 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 ha what happened? So in general, when I, so basically just comparing like the typical way we represent vegetation in an earth system model with these modern plant functional types to the creating late Paleozoic plant functional types is overall what I'm finding is the transpiration rates of those plants are a lot higher than our modern analogs. And so depending on where you put those vegetation, that can act to basically just 
act as, I don't know if it's appropriate to call it a straw, but basically they transpire so much water that the balance of rainfall coming down uh, relative to the, to the evapotranspiration leaving the ground creates drying in those regions. Um, and there's also some changes in atmospheric circulation in that specific region that tend to uh, enhance the drying. So it's a couple different factors. Good. All right, well, thank you, Sophia. We, we'll uh, stay on schedule and move on to the next speaker, thanks. Okay, thank you.